What's up, everyone? We're back. I'm Dr. Shaw. Dr. Maxfield. And welcome back to Doctorly Unhinged. We have potentially one of the best episodes ever. And the reason why is we're going to be talking about a lot of the business of skincare, which is one of my favorite topics. But we're in the transition right now from the summer into the fall. So we're going to be talking about a little bit about the transitions and some of the procedures that we personally will be looking forward to in the office, not just for our patients, but for ourselves. We're also going to be talking about your dentist doing Botox. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? The reemergence of anti-aging skincare and why it's so difficult to get rid of this term. Uh, the rare beauty sale process has gone amok. And the future of skincare, according to McKinsey, the top consulting firm in the United States. So let's get into it, starting nice. with our life updates. Life updates. Life update for me, if you can appreciate the change in the wall behind me. I painted it myself and I, I like a little candid moment here. I'm going to tip the camera. So I didn't paint the whole thing because really, what does it matter? I just need this part to look good. So, but still I sanded it, I prepped it, and then I put two layers of paint in and I think it looks quite nice. So that's my life update. I'm very proud of this moment. Oof. I should do a house tour once we're done. Um, we, we have spent on, on, in, uh, unquantifiable amount of time on making changes to this house. And now there's wallpaper. Um, I think you saw the wallpaper, right? Mm -hmm. Dr. Maxfield. Sure um, and then we now also have Venetian plaster, which is like clay that they put on your walls. And I mean, it looks super cool, but it's a mess. It's created a gigantic mess in the house and it's taken way longer than they said it was going to take. They were like, Oh, it'll be done in two days. It's been, like three weeks. So it's just this never ending process of putting plaster on our walls. Um, looks super cool. Um, but I'll, I'll show you the update when it's over. I have some good before and afters that will be coming soon. So a lot of construction going on at the house. What other life updates do you have? Let's see here. Uh, just rolling in their practice, going great. Amazing, amazing, amazing people. Some of the kindest and most patient people in the world here. Um, so I've just been humbled again, just by the quality of human beings that I get to interact with on a daily basis. Just Mostly that. Supposed to go to New York this week. That got postponed. So that will be some other time. But pretty much it. Settling in. And like I said last time, it feels great to be settled. Like it feels really good. Yeah, I feel like I'm going to feel the same way once the once the house is done under construction. It's going to be nice to just be able to like sit on the couch in peace in a clean house. So super looking forward to that. Um, other life updates. Let's see what's going on in the world of remedy. We are launching a new product, supposedly October 1st. Um, if everything, if all the raw ingredients hit the way that they're supposed to hit, um, we have already done the pilot patch for it and all looks good. So we're, we're definitely on the right track for an October 1st launch. I'll put a waitlist link, um, in the description here, just so that everybody has the opportunity to get a first crack at it before, it, um, before it launches or before it launches to the public. So um, I'll put a waitlist link so that you can all um, participate in that and always appreciate all your support. I think, again, I was saying on the last episode, like this is the product if you haven't found the product yet, meaning that you don't have dark spots, but you're looking for something that's going to be pretty much universally universally applicable to a lot of people. This is going to be sort of that product for you. So I'm super excited to talk about it once it's once it's complete. And then and then we also got a beauty award. So this is our first award um, that we've oh, gotten nice. from editors. And this was from Women's Health. And it was Remedy for Body Bumps as the best product for KP. So super, super cool for us um, and a surprise for us as well. And we're also still sold out. So <laughs> you know, there's not <laughs> much we can do about that. So uh, it's just like it's in stock for like a week and then it goes out. So it's just um, we, we really just got to get better about um, getting the right quantity for people. It's that's a good problem. Amazing. It's a good problem. Very great. Congratulations though. That's, I mean, in a sense, not unexpected. Like I was telling, who was I talking to this week? Uh, um, I don't know, probably just a random patient, but I was like, yeah, remedy. Like these are just the premier product. Oh, it was my esthetician. Yeah. I was just telling her about these products. I was like, I think these are just so good that they are the best, like no bias at all. You can't objectively look at these products and say they're not good. Like no matter what standpoint you're coming from, uh, just top tier. And the price, of course, to boot, I still don't know how you pulled that off. Like you're making 10 cents per product. And I think that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're profitable. Um, no, I appreciate I, I definitely appreciate the love. It's funny because like it's hard because like I really did put everything like I could think of into the products and like 
try to make them as best as possible. So there is this like inherent bias now where it's like hard to shake it because it's like, I know what, what I put in this, I know how it works. I know how it performs. So it's hard to like not have it in my mind as the best dark spot product or the best KP product, because like if there was better things I could have added, I would put them. That's like the, the conundrum I found myself in now is like, it would be disingenuous. I feel like to, to say that, you know, I like this other product better. I think there are products that are like, you know, let's say for example, like cystiamine, um, Cispera, like is an ingredient that's not in our dark spot product, could be used separately as a wash off product for dark spots, hydroquinone prescription, like, of course, good option, you know? So like, of course, there's like things I would, of course, recommend to su supplement remedy for dark spots, but it, it's really hard um, for me to like think that we didn't complete, create the greatest product. <laughs> so that's like super biased. I'm trying to like shake that of it. And because I think it's important, like that I continue to challenge it so that we can constantly make better products that, you know, we don't get too comfortable with what we created. So I know I appreciate the love though. So let's, uh, let's hop into our product of the day. I actually have something, a blast from the past, our first YouTube review. What? Oh, ha, huh, that one is, let me see. I'm, I can't even remember who it is. Um, okay. I'll, I'll, well, maybe it's is... not, maybe it's not. It's, uh, the Vichy oh. mineral, mineral 89. I just think this is, you know, we're moving into fall. This is probably going to find its way off of the counter, but I just, I think that this product, like, you know, just despite all the products that come out in that hydration category, this is really just one of the nicest products on the market, truly. Mm -hmm. uh, Vichy Mineral 89, like probably the, one of my top favorite hyaluronic acid serums. Oh, I agree. I remember we were doing the video and the Anua product came on and just comparing, I know that's like a glycerin forward product, but we mentioned in the video, like how HA products sit on the skin and it should be better than that. The Vichy one just... It's great. Aesthetically, it feels amazing. It is hydrating. Um, love that one. Still, but four years later, still in my top and go-to HA products. Definitely. Mine is the cleanser. So someone texted us and was like, hey, have you tried this uh, goat cleanser from Dermatology, DMR, the Novalis Dermatology? And um, so we got it. I got it in the mail. And it's rare I'll look at a cleanser or try a cleanser and I'm, whoa this is good, but I did. So the, the thing, when I try a cleanser, I wash my face, let it sit, let the skin dry, see how it feels later. Kind of just the same way you try check your skin type. It was great. Hydrating, good lather. Like it felt good going on. It felt good an hour later. So that, that cleanser is going to make it into my regular routine. Um, I think it's a winner. Actually, it's probably a good one for this winter because it, it was really non-stripping. Like a measure of a good cleanser is it's effective and non-stripping. So that one is going to make it into my roster. Yeah, I haven't. Um, he's they sent it to us. Um, I haven't tried it yet. I'm gonna be honest. So <laughs> before I pass judgment, I have to use cleansers, and I, and I will use almost any cleanser you send me. So yeah. cleansers, moisturizers, sunscreens are gonna get a use out of me because I am always willing to change those items in my routine um, and try to find like you know better ones or more hydrating ones. I'm trying to think if there's something recently that I've been using in the moisturizing category. No, uh, I, like other than this Vichy product, I'm trying, I feel like I introduced something new and I'm can't remember quite. Oh, the it's the um, the different different has like a a polyhydroxy acid cleanser um, that I've been mm. I've been I've been using lately in my shower and I like it quite a bit. So it's like an exfoliating cleanser. It doesn't have any beads or anything in it, but it's an exfoliating cleanser that I like quite a bit. So always trying new things. Uh, I want to try this goat the goat cleanser. Uh, and see how it is. Yeah, it's a good one. All right, let's hop into procedures for this fall. So let's give you a little context here on why we'd be talking about procedures being different in the fall and the winter. Um, so basically, it's very difficult to do procedures, some procedures during the summertime. So during the summertime, some procedures are still relevant, but a lot of times these like resurfacing lasers um, or just, or even like IPL or anything that's kind of targeting pigment is challenging to do because this is usually the tannest your skin is going to be. And it's also going to be when you're getting the most sun exposure. A lot of people are spending the weekend out, you know, going to the park, um, going on vacation, going to the beach. And so when you get a lot of sun exposure in the, so twofold, one, some procedures are not appropriate while your skin is tan, something like IPL, something that's targeting pigment, uh, because it will target the pigment. You'll get really severe burns if you're tan before the procedure. And then some procedures are not good. Um, if you're getting sun exposure after the procedure. So something like CO2 
erbium, uh, fraxel, you really don't want it. You really want to minimize your sun exposure, right? So, you know, you really need to be diligent about sun protection unless you're me and you don't follow any of the rules. Um, it's a terrible idea to, <laughs> to do that. So this is why in the fall and the winter is the best time to be getting those, those deep resurfacing laser procedures and also IPL um, to be getting rid of the pigment on the skin. So, um, so what are you looking forward to? So for procedures we'll be doing more of this winter already kind of stacking up some co2 uh we have a beautiful device from mrp and uh it's just it's an amazing procedure co2 just get dramatic results like i, I swear you like once you get some before and afters it sells itself because it's so consistent and it's a good price tag so i always tell people like it's an investment i never minimize that but i'll be doing a lot more co2 for patients a lot of ipl i, I love ipl i think the results can be extremely effective and uh, for myself, for myself, uh, probably some IPL hair removal. That is going to be, I'm going to be smooth. No chest hair. Can I get with no? No, I'm going to keep that. But I am going to get some IPL hair removal um, for my esthetician this, this fall. And it's going to be good. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Shout out to MRP, by the way. So I don't know how relevant this is going to be to anybody who's listening to the podcast, but if you are, you know, a PA, NP, esthetician, dermatologist who is following us, I cannot sing the praises of MRP enough. So MRP is one of the larger um, laser distributors and device distributors in the cosmetic industry. Um, and they just have phenomenal pricing and phenomenal customer service. Like they deliver every time. Um, you know, when I was buying devices for all three offices, um, North Carolina, New York, and Tennessee MRP was our first choice always across the board and they deliver every single time. So I cannot, if you are in the industry of buying devices, uh, which very few of you will be, uh, I, I cannot recommend them highly enough. So um, that's my shout out to them. Yeah, a uh, little anecdote. One of uh, my friends, he owns practice. He's a doctor. His device broke down. He, I don't even know if he, I don't think he bought it from MRP, but he was buying some other things and he got on with MRP's customer service and they walked him through the repairs of the other device, like from front to back. They're super knowledgeable too. So like their service, customer service, technical service, outstanding guests. So this is a professional tidbit, may not be helpful for the majority of people, but yeah, I think the world of them, they are top tier. Totally, completely, 1000% agree. So for me, um, I am probably overdue for Botox, as you can tell. So I will, but this is not relevant to the laser conversation, but I, I do Botox <laughs> about every nine months or so, and I'm probably hitting that nine month period at this point. So it's probably time um, for me to get a little touch up there. And and I recently got clear and brilliant done, um, which I got a ton of sun exposure afterwards, not best practices, um, but I like it quite a bit. And that's probably what I'll be doing. Another session of clear and brilliant is what I would say. And I'll just be a little bit better about protecting my skin afterwards. Nice. You know, what's funny. Do you remember, uh, I'm going to make a video about this this week, actually, because the uh, reps coming back out. But uh, do you remember Daxify? Remember how wildly that blew up pre-launch? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I'm so tempted. We have it and we use it here. Um, but I'm so tempted to do like a split base, like Daxify on my right side and then like um, just Botox in the left. See which one lasts longer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like walk. everybody hyped this thing up at the launch. It was incredible. And, you know, I was honestly skeptical. One, like, you know, I, I don't like to just read a study and say, because when it comes to patient care, like this is the thing, right? There's a lot of good studies. And a lot of times they only publish the good studies, right? Like it's their, in their interest, right? These are industry funded studies. And I'm not saying that we should discredit all these industry funded studies because they're the only ones doing the research, right? But they're going to publish favorable data, right? And I'm not saying it's not an accurate data. It's, it's accurate, but it's favorable data, obviously to them, right? And so a lot of times like doctors, chemists, um, you know, Scient to other scientists like we'll read these studies and kind of like take them as fact right and they'll say oh well this is what this said and 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 but then when you actually like use these things on patients they like 
a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes don't work out as intended. And then, so they have a big launch, right? Because they do a lot of marketing behind them. They pu push all the studies out there. Everybody reads the studies. The studies look favorable because they're supposed to look favorable. And then everyone kind of like hops on the trend of doing it. And then probably about six months after using it and all the doctors start using it, they decide whether or not this is something that's going to have longevity within their practice, right? So, you know, I, that's why I'm always like skeptical in the first like six months to a year of a launch of a new thing, because that's when we're going to find out whether or not it's going to have long term legs on it. Like, for example, when levy studies look great, patients hate using it because of the thickness of this product. Um, this is like a, a hormonal acne treatment. Um, what was the one that was Pfizer? It was like a Pfizer topical cream for eczema. Um, uh, I thought you were going to go with Escada for SKs. Um, Chrissa Boral. Eucrissa. So Eucrissa, right? <laughs> that's it. Oh, that was, so, that's what we're talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eucrissa. Eucrissa. Yeah. So you, Eucrissa was one of those, right? Came out, you know, eczema yeah. cure, right? And then everybody used it for like six months to a year. And they're like, yeah, this doesn't do anything but burn. Like it feels like it burns. It's not actually burning the skin. But it's like uncomfortable feeling. Um and everyone's like, okay, this doesn't work. So Durham stopped using it. And then the Pfizer starts marketing to the primary care doctors, right? The family medicine, the pediatricians and going to their office saying this is the next best thing because the Durham's had used it for eczema and realized it didn't work, stopped using it. And then they started. And then, and then now I don't think anybody pretty much uses it anymore. I use it in one scenario, and that's for uh, kids with eczema under the age of two because it is like the only FDA fda approved steroid sparing agent like there's nothing else so i, I totally agree i totally put a uh Chris into that category of something that on paper works well and anytime like someone pulls a base study this is exactly like the conversation i have in the real world they're like oh well this study of like 20 patients you had way bigger studies oh this is, looks good on paper in the real world it doesn't pan out and that's why like the professional anecdote the professional experience is like so important you is like a poster child for that in my opinion Exactly. Exactly. So, um, I don't know where I was going with this. Um, Daxify? Daxify. Yeah. So <laughs> Daxify comes out and everyone's like, it's the greatest thing. It lasts longer. And then I had two questions. One, does it really last longer? Right. And what does that look like in real patient life and experience? Right. So yeah, let's use it and see what people, what people's experience with that is. Um, there's two things like what is the price of it going to be because that was never transparent and so is it going to be double the price because it lasts twice as long as botox so then the patient savings is zero and then they just come in less often okay so now you're kind of like at net net zero but then the other thing is the other question that i had was like do we even really want it to last that long right and that was my question right one do i want to be frozen for six months me personally no Second thing is if you have a complication, which is, is it does happen in like 1%, 1 to 3% of cases, depending on what study that you read, where you get like a droopy eyelid or you get um, kind of like a uh, uneven smile or, or, you know, just one of the side effects that come from Botox. Um, do you want that side effect to last now six months, right? So it's like all of these questions that I have um, around it. And I was like, not that excited for the launch. And now I'll be curious to see what happens a year or two from now, whether or not Daxify is still popular and um, I'd be curious to see your use of it and whether or not it does last longer and whether or not you want it to last longer. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, uh, well, next time you see me and like half my face is moving and the other half isn't, we'll know for sure. Yeah. This actually would be like an incredible split face. Yeah. I think it's <laughs> worth doing. <laughs> I'm really tempted. Who else is going to do it? I mean, if I don't do it, no one will. I think you should do it or you should do it on somebody in the office. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so yeah, you could use one of the, uh, you could use chase, um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, our, the PA at the office, incredible guy. Um, we should try it on him. <laughs> um, yeah. So no, you, cause you, cause you're in front of the camera all the time. Um, so you got to decide if that's what you want or not, but I, I think know. it's easy to correct, right? Like you'd be in a two week period where you're just like, all right, let me put a little bit of Botox on this side of the face to kind well, of we're gonna get in this out. vicious cycle where like my right side of the face doesn't move. So I have to hit the uh, left side of the face and then the left side of the face is not going to move. And then I have to hit the right side of the face. It's going to be like this alternating cycle of like one side moves, one doesn't and trying to play catch up for eternity. You wouldn't. I'll tell you how you fix it. How? All right. What you would do is you would then you would say okay at three months botox wears off on one side of the face your daxify is still frozen 
you inject Daxify on the face side of the face that has um, the Botox, and you inject Daxify in the side of the face that's still not moving. So I would you kind of like double way overdo it on both sides. Both yeah, sides you'd overdo it on. You, yeah, you'd freeze both sides, and then it would equilibrate. <laughs> so interesting. I do want to do studies out of this office, though. A lot of um, OTC cosmetic studies in this office. So <laughs> maybe this is the launching point. Right. Right. Uh, all right. So let's talk about what we're... Okay. So we talked about the procedures. What do you want to switch products wise? So um, let's do our switch this for that series. So what product are you currently using? And I will tell you what you should switch it for. Okay. So we will start with the uh, morning cleanser. So we'll go with the... I use a lot of different face washes for the record. Um, okay. Okay. Let's see if you can switch this one up because this one's not that bad. I'm using the Aveeno... Oh, gel cleanser if it's a mm. gel cleanser so it's a gel cleanser so presumably better for oily skin um you could switch to just like more of a cream based cleanser i like the neutrogena hydro boost cleanser that's a really nice cleanser that foams but is still pretty hydrating or cerave's cream to foam cleanser which is going to be a little bit more for that normal skin type so you just want to sh switch to something that's a little bit more hydrating a little bit less stripping i imagine the avino one is usually pretty gentle i feel like avino doesn't get enough love yeah that that that's true that's why i was like kind of a toss-up whether or not you even need to switch this one out but you really could go with something more hydrating like you said so after your cleanser then you have well let's go with uh it does ha go next or vitamin c it doesn't matter so let's go with the ha since we already talked about it the vichy ha serum which i definitely use in the summer like especially when i'm really hard on my skin outside so Switching out the HA serum from Vichy, what do you do? Hmm. Uh, well, you know, I think in the fall you could, you know, you could just go for like your heavier creams or your your creams for kind of more normal skin. I'm not huge on, um, you know, adding these in the fall time um, because generally I use like a gel cream or like a hyaluronic acid serum in the summer and then. I kind of move away from those things in the fall and the winter. So I would say you could probably skip it all together, quite honestly. Okay. So we're skipping the extra hydrating serum step in lieu of a moisturizer. And we'll, just, we'll do that when we swab out the moisturizers. Then we have vitamin C or whatever antioxidants you choose, because what else would you use in the morning? Um, the vitamin C, oh, the one I've really liked actually is the Biosance, uh, the vitamin Biosance C, vitamin dark C. spot one. Yeah, the dark spot one. So good. 3 of ethyl ascorbic, vitamin C. Um, I think 3 ethyl ascorbic is really the way to go. I do too. I've decided uh, hmm. it's stable, it's effective, and it doesn't have the same problems that ascorbic acid has. So I think I think I'm I think we should make a concerted effort to elevate this one in the skincare space. Yeah. So okay, vitamin C. Uh, just keep it if you're using something you love. Or what? Yeah, I would say you could keep using your antioxidant serum it, because it could have like other benefits, right? Through one, you know, of course, in the summer it has, you know, it's, it's just interesting, right? Like certain things are in there for certain purposes at certain times, right? So vitamin C, like as an antioxidant in the summer is really where it shines. But, you know, vitamin C still also has those collagen building, collagen supporting properties, so there's no reason why you can't continue using it for the other benefits because it helps with dark spots. It helps with collagen. So I would say if it's something that your skin tolerates well, there's no reason why you wouldn't want to continue that into the fall. It's just going to have different benefits, let's say, or the emphasis of its benefits are going to be elsewhere. Yeah. Okay. So we're keeping that. It just takes a, a different role for your skin in the fall and winter. So after vitamin C, now we'll go to the moisturizer. So summer for me, moisturizers. Um, usually it's, yeah, usually let's say it's probably the Biosans gel moisturizer or the, uh, Vichy, uh, mineral 89, not the, well, they're, they're light, their cream is actually pretty light. Like the, not the rich one, the just daytime one that's fragrance free. So let's go with the Biosans gel moisturizer, probiotic moisturizer. Cause that one I use very consistently. Yeah. Um, hmm. yeah. So I think in the summer, that is an incredible moisturizer for the fall. I would switch to the Kiehl's ultra facial cream. I really do think that this product is, well, it's still a top seller. Like despite all the products that come out, all the moisturizers that come out, 
And it really is just a nice balanced moisturizer for the fall, for normal skin, for really just anybody who, like if you said, okay, I want a product because, you know, the, the, there's a lot of like for all skin types type of messaging on products sometimes. Um, I really think that this is the product that is for all skin types and for all seasons. Like if you were to say a moisturizer that really can go with anyone, I would say Ultra Facial Cream would fall into that category. Mm. Okay, this is a good one. Such a consistent recommend. You're going to be a very boring 80 year old individual because you're going to be using the same skincare 30, 40 years from now. I can tell. <laughs> no, for sure. I, I am like once I find the things I like, I just stick with them. So for better or worse, you get a lot of consistency from me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sunscreens. So sunscreens. Um, Boy, did I use one more than another this summer? The only ones I used were wildly unesthetic. So I will say, which ones did I uh, use otherwise often enough? Uh, what does it go with what I used? Uh, the, so I've been using a lot of the Freaks of Nature and Sun Bum, Baby Bum. Those are the, the thick zinc mineral sunscreens. So those are my summertime skincare sunscreens because I'm just going straight up protection outside active life. Mm, okay, so you want to move off of active life to something that's maybe a little bit more elegant. Mm -hmm. um, hmm, okay. I really like, I mean, I still think, you know, for that dewy look, I really, really have been loving the Naturium Dew Glow mm. sunscreens. I, I really think that they're nice, they're affordable, they blend super well into the skin, and they really give you your skin that extra kind of boost. That, that's what I would say. I would switch to that. Nice. Okay. And then for lips, I, in the summer, I generally use no chapstick. I broke my chapstick addiction years ago. Um, in the winter, I can't quite get by. Now that I've moved, I am 100% certain I cannot get by without a lip balm, even no matter what I try. So what in the world could your recommendation be for that? Oh, I might have something for that. No, uh, it's funny because before we even hit record on this podcast episode, we were mentioning how I, I was saying like, I need something for my lips before we get started because there's nothing worse one before you're about to talk for a long period of time, having dry lips um, and just having dry lips in general affects the quality of my day. Like if I cannot find something to put on my lips, like I almost start to panic in a way, like even when I'm seeing patients, I'm like, I got to find something like I start to become hyper aware of my lips being dry. And um, that's why we created Remedy for Dry Lips in general. I mean, it really just has those hydrating and reparative properties. Like I always say, it's not decoration for the lips, like a lot of the products that are out there. It's not fun. It's not a party on your lips. It's it's a repair job on your lips. So um, Remedy for Dry Lips is, is my go-to. I mean, I have these all over the house. I have these in every vehicle. I have these in every pocket of every pair of jeans. Um, and, and I'm not the only one, like pretty much everybody on the remedy team has these all over the house. So, um, and, and like, it's just become like an obsession in a way. So yeah, remedy for dry lips, but there's a lot of other great lip products out there. Okay. So there it is. Remedy for dry lips. And now we're into the evening. We're going to use the same cleanser because we do that. We're simple folks. And then the actives actives. I mean, I've been. I mean, this gets real simple for me now, like remedy for pores. And what would you sub that out with? Yeah, I mean, remedy for pores really is like a great product for oily skin. Um, and if you said, okay, well, you know, I want something that's a little bit more hydrating, um, or probably our newest product that's about to come out mm. would be the best fit for that. Um, but, you know, these products are like very interchangeable. Let's say that you got a lot of dark spots over the summer um discoloration uneven skin tone that you want to start to promote even skin tone you could switch out to you know um remedy for uh remedy for dark spots which is just much more hydrating base or you could switch to your tretinoin script tretinoin you could switch script to you could switch to just really any retinoid um and i would say even you know for the for the for this time of the year i'm actually like looking more towards exfoliation 
we shot a video on chemical exfoliation. We kind of highlighted the new L'Oreal snake peel product. And I think this would be a good opportunity to like really start to do your heavy exfoliation again. So I would keep your retinoid as is, quite honestly, whether you're using Remedy or another retinoid or tretinoin, I don't care which one. It's just I would keep it because I think it's going to still do the heavy lifting. And then I would actually add in exfoliation twice a week around this time um, in, instead of the retinoid. And so I'd go with like a heavier exfoliant and whether it's the snake peel one or the one from the ordinary or the one from Paul's choice, um, that's going to be up to you. I actually really liked the snake peel one. The, uh, the, the interesting thing about the snake peel was that it like got on my carpet. Oh no. <laughs> and it's like the thickest product ever. Like it maintained that like thick, it was almost like gum by the time I got to it. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, so I, so I think it actually worked really well cause I had used it on my nose and uh, I felt like my nose was like much smoother and I've actually even been noticing about your skin. I wanted to call it out. I feel like your skin is maybe the best it's been in years. So I'm curious to know what you've been up to. Well, as I told you, I said that, um, next time you saw me, which then I forgot to kind of point it out when I saw you, cause I think I've seen you twice since then. <laughs> Uh, I feel like I actually feel the same way. Like occasionally like the rosacea breakouts happen. That's just life in your thirties and forties. But in general, all of the background stuff, I feel like is the best it's been. in I don't know, maybe since I was 20, who knows? But yeah, for the, for me, I, I actually do think it's still a remedy for pores. Just like I said, that's the consistent thing I've done. And, um, yeah, I swear by it, anecdotally, I think that has been a game changer. I will say like, cause it's your dark spots that really are, are, are shockingly better. Um, mm -hmm. to me. Um, so I, I was noticing that and you posted like a video the other day where I was just like, whoa, his skin looks like really good. I don't know if it was on your stories or it was like the most recent video that you posted. Um, and even the last episode of the podcast, I was like, whoa, okay, here we go. I'm just trying to see <laughs> if I can find the video. <laughs> I think it's this one where you're wearing like the blue. Like, oh, look, yeah. at, look at how like glowy your skin is. Do you see that? It's actually yeah. kind of wild. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, so I was thinking a few that. times I've been shooting a video and I'm like, dang, why is my skin so bad? Oh like, yeah. Like the other one when it's like, do you want to use tretinoin every night? Whatever that sound was. Same thing. I saw that. It's like, dang, this is like, it's a big difference if for me. It's just like, you know, we look at ourselves in the camera a lot because of what we do. And for me, it's an appreciable difference. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I think, I think that was totally sidetracked there. So, oh, yeah, all right. Yeah. So. I would, I would switch in some exfoliation and then I would use probably the same moisturizer at night that you're using during the day. Or you could go with like a, like a heavier, like kind of like a night mask type cream. Mm. Um, but fall, I don't know, maybe fall is a little too soon to get your like skin fix triple lipid back in the mix. Yeah. Okay. So retinoids, it's uh, like kind of going back to summarizing because I, I also lost track of where we were again. But yeah, so retinoid stays, add in your heavy exfoliants for this time of year for the boost in benefits. I'm with you. That makes sense. Yep. And then follow with a moisturizer at night. And that's pretty much it. I mean, I think that's the transition. I mean, simply adding exfoliation, going for more hydrating cleansers and thicker moisturizers is really just the direction. It's kind of a, a simple switch from this time period. So um, no, no reason to change your actives too heavily. Um, now let's go to this next topic and I would say maybe a little bit controversial, but I'd be curious to hear what the audience has to say about this, but also I'm really curious about your opinion of this, Dr. Maxfield. So the article is coming out of glossy and they're highlighting this new, let's say dentist office, um, but also like wellness spa. Um, that it's in New York City and it's called SAMA. Um, I don't know much about it, but the article is called One Stop Shop, How Botox and Fillers Made Their Way Into the Dentist Office. And the article kind of goes through um, this one person's practice. They're kind of highlighting this one person's practice and how like wellness is so important to oral hygiene and now basically turning this dental office into more of a wellness spa where they're doing things like they have a sauna and they have they're doing botox and they're doing fillers and all these other things that are maybe outside of the scope of traditional dentistry but now found their way into these sort of wellness practices 
that are really more dentistry focused. And, you know, kind of this is leading to a larger rise of just sort of these wellness programs in general, like the wellnessification of pretty much all of our, all industries, right? It started, you started in nutrition and exercise, you know, through you know, these larger gyms like Equinox and um, Anatomy. And then now like, you know, the nutrition, the AG ones of the world, all that. And now it's finding its way into the medical offices. Um, so I just, I'm curious about what your thoughts are on in general dentists doing Botox and fillers um, and just sort of the wellnessification of cosmetic dermatology in general. So I think it's more, it, it almost like the, the generalization of cosmetic practice in general, because um, I guess the question is twofold. Like, can the dentist perform this? Yes. Like sometimes it makes a lot of sense. Like if you're going to do for TMJ, Botox being used in the masseters to alleviate that, it makes a lot of sense. Similarly, Botox can be used for headaches. And it's like, who, who, who really should be doing that? Um, should dermatologists be doing that because we use Botox elsewhere? Should a dentist be doing that because they happen to use Botox I I for TMJ? And then it goes one step further and then it's like, okay, well, we're already injecting something. We should, it might as well inject filler too. And it almost kind of goes into the same conversation. I've seen a dermatologist on, to, I don't know, TikTok or Instagram, who knows which, talk about how basically they wish plastic surgeons, why, why are they talking about skincare? They should stop. They shouldn't be making skincare brands. Um, and it, it's not that I don't think that they have the capacity to do these things, uh, back to the dentist. Like I think Botox, you know, a lot of people just do like a weekend course and then they start doing Botox, like if, if even that. So there's not a tight regulation on Botox and who should be doing it. And while I think a lot of people technically can do it, um, you know, for us, it, it's actually like a core part of our curriculum. Like it's not heavy in our curriculum. It's not at all a foundation of dermatology, but because dermatologists do skin front to back it's on a cellular level to the clinical ramifications to ramifications, manifestations, sorry, combine those words to like even surgical repairs, I think it makes the most sense for dermatologists to be front and center for this type of procedure. And um, I don't know, I, it does seem out of place, I think, for a dentist to have like a whole wellness spa because their, their specialization rel relatively early on from the beginning, it, it really is kind of one organ focused. Dermatologists, although we do go through like this postdoctorate graduate level training of what an extra three years four years if you include that after medical school we still had the four years of medical school for general medicate general education and then we also had one year of general medicine so i think if you're talking about broadness and scope it's more of a stretch for someone who specializes in one thing to expand out than perhaps for um, a medical specialist to expand out like a plastic surgeon to go into skincare um, i mean their training is so extensive i, I think dr prem's take on it because he actually defended this point. They, he was like, why did plastic surgeons talk about skincare? And he's like, well, I mean, he basically was just like, I'm admitting that surgery alone is not the cure for a healthy appearance. You have to couple surgical skills and surgical procedures with healthy skin if you want a great outcome. Like you can't just do one or the other. If you neglect the skin, but do the surgery, you don't have a complete picture. So I think that from a plastic surgeon standpoint makes a lot of sense. And I think that makes more sense than the uh, dentist take. Mm, okay. No, I like the take. Um, you know, I, I kind of want to challenge the system in some ways here. So here's just a background for those of you who want to understand like how people get to be certain professions. So I think that's where the nuance comes in here. So in order to become a dermatologist, you do four years of medical school, um, four years of residency in dermatology. Three is just specifically focused on dermatology and the skin. And during that, you read multiple textbooks on, on skincare and dermatology. And you also read um, and you also take exams um, directed at this. And also part of our curriculum, in order to graduate, we need to do a certain number of procedures in this like neuromodulator filler category and lasers, right? So they have to be like supervised and checked off in order to graduate, right? 
And then we're tested on these things. And it's not a huge part of our curriculum, like Dr. Maxfield said, but it is part of our curriculum and it is a requirement to graduate. And then we go to conferences throughout our training where we're exposed to different types of skin cares. Um, we go to all different types of webinars. We also have people coming into our office to teach us about different skincare and their brands and they're marketing the brands to us, of course, because they want them to us to use them in their practice. And so when it comes to skincare, lasers, fillers, and Botox, dermatologists are truly the experts in these things, uh, meaning that we are from the very beginning taught these and they are part of our curriculum. Does that mean that I am better at doing lip filler than a dentist is? No, there could be a dentist who is better at doing lip filler than me. And that's because this dentist decided in their own time to learn how to do lip filler. And they've made it a core part of their identity and a core part of what they do in practice. And so, and say, for example, I don't do any lip filler. I do do lip filler to be clear, but let's say I didn't do any lip filler, right? Like I, I was a dermatologist who decided that I don't want to do any lip filler after training. I did my requirements as a resident graduated and then decided I don't want to do any filler anymore, period, in my practice. 10 years pass by, I don't do any filler. And then the dentist down the street decides they want to do filler. They take courses, they train, they take, they, they refresh on anatomy, they go through the proper process, they become an expert in filler. They get very good results. Who's better at filler, me or the dentist who did all this extra training? Pro probably the dentist, if I'm being like fully honest, right? So this is where we kind of get in trouble because I think that there are ENTs, there are dentists, there are plastic surgeons who become very good at certain things. And it's because they, as a human being, as a professional, decided to dedicate part of their time and extracurricular time on learning something that was outside of their scope. And they've decided to make it within their scope, okay? And they can be very good at it. And so when then they post these things on social media or they start to make it a core part of their, their practice, they are very good at it. And I would personally trust these people to do these things. But this is a select group of people. And the problem then becomes that anyone can go and do it. So... Then you have a dentist who decides, I'm going to do this also because it's clearly a way to make a lot of money. But they didn't put the time in that that other dentist put in to become an expert in this particular thing. And so what you're going to find in dentistry and what you're going to find in plastic surgery, not for filler, because fillers, lasers, and Botox is a core part of the, the, the I don't want to get confusing here, but it's part of, it's core part of the plastic surgery curriculum. But let's say, let's, let's go outside of scope. Let's say dentistry and internal medicine doctor and ER doctor. I've seen many, I've seen OBGYNs open up cosmetic wellness clinics, right? So say somebody who has no expertise in these things, right? Like they have no training, absolutely zero training in this. They decide that they're going to make it a core part of their thing and they get very, very good at it. The problem is the difference, the variation you're going to see from one ER doc doing Botox to the next ER doc doing Botox is going to be mass and tremendous and could be very, very scary and dangerous. Whereas when you see a, a, a dermatologist doing Botox or filler or laser, there is a core average of skill there. Um, meaning that like, since it's part of our core curriculum, there is at least a inherent skill set set where we're both trained on how to do it properly, but also how to do it safely and also how to reverse any damage that we've done. And so we know at least have been educated. You can, you can trust that every dermatologist has some core training in this. Now, whether or not they've decided to make it a core part of their practice, that's going to be up to them, but there is some core basic knowledge. So the variation between one dermatologist to the next is going to be much less than the variation of one dentist to the next dentist because they just don't have the core part of their training. They have to take it upon themselves. So you as the consumer have to decide whether or not you think the person who's doing it has that core expertise, right? We have uh, Dr. Cassell, who you guys have seen on the channel in the past, uh, when he was doing his interviews for, for dermatology residency, he had gotten Botox by his dentist and he was peaked out of control. Like he had the crazy Spock. And, and then he was on one of his interviews and one of the dermatologists in, uh, in, in Jacksonville was interviewing him and he's like, I have to fix your Botox. Um, and he fixed it. Uh, so that's Dr. K. You know Dr. K, right? Yeah.
Um, so, so, so anyway, my point is that you're going to see great variability. And so if you're, if, if you, if you've found a dentist who is well known in your area for doing this, they've, you've had friends that have gone, they have incredible before and afters, they have a really good reputation. I would say, sure, go see your dentist for your Botox and filler. The problem is that if you're, if you're, if you're going into a new territory, where you don't know anything about these people or these providers, you don't have any word of mouth, I would, I'd be very cautious of going to somebody that doesn't have core competency in a particular subject. And I would say that that would, where, where I'd get nervous is where you're like, kind of like finding a group on from, you know, a dentist who's doing Botox because you don't know whether or not they've done this. Now I will say dentists do have profound knowledge of facial anatomy. So because they f focus on the mouth, they do have tons of knowledge around the face, especially the lower face, right? So when you're talking about the muscles of the lower face, um, you're talking about the nerves of the lower face, like they, they know this area very well. So, and they're also very good with their hands because working in the mouth is also requires a lot of dexterity. So it's a skill set that they certainly could learn if they put the time into it. It's just that you don't know whether or not they put the time into it. So just do your research before going to somebody. And this is like a very, very long thing here, but do your research before going to somebody who doesn't have core competency based on their training in that subject. So the only two specialties that get training in this in residency are derms and plastic surgeons and then ENTs if they do a facial plastic surgery. Um, a facial plastics a fellowship. So ENT with facial plastic training, to reiterate, a plastic surgeon and a dermatologist are the only ones with core training in lasers, Botox, and fillers. So yeah, it is. I mean, that's it. I mean, it's tough because like you said, and I think like I kind of got to, everyone has extensive training. It's not like you can't pick up this skill, but I think your take on like the variability is probably the most important piece because I have seen quite a few pop-ups where someone just kind of says, oh, I'm going to do it now. And I, I see this in other medical areas as well. It's not just like Botox. It's not just cosmetics. Like I'll see someone just, oh, yeah, like I'm going to do this now because it's lucrative. Like, so they're expanding and diversifying their uh, their scope in a sense to, uh, I don't know, what are Chase the money. Or, yeah. <laughs> or so, the yeah, lifestyle. Or the lifestyle. Which is, have I you mean, had any friends that. like from like residency? I, I've had a few, quite a few friends text me this like, I have friends who are ER doctors, internal medicine doctors who have texted me and be like, Hey, I'm thinking about opening up a Medi spa. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. What, what do you like? Do you know any good training courses to get started? So it's rampant, um, for sure. And I just think that you need to be very cautious as the person who's guarding your skin. You, you are the guardian of your skin and you decide who you want working on your face. Um, just do your research before you go into these places. And I'm not saying that they're bad or they're going to cause harm to you. Um, they just need, they need to have be ethical and they need to have done the training necessary to make sure that they can do these procedures both safely and effectively. Yeah. Yeah. makes sense. So, um, so yeah, so this spot, by the way, this one that they're highlighting here in this article, it looks beautiful. Um, and I, and I kind of as a separate conversation, I do think like the wellnessification of skin, like meaning that like skincare will start to become more of like a plan, um, that you just like you have a workout plan. And you have personal trainers for working out. I do see that happening probably in skin and 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 like sort of like longevity of of skin. I, I see that happening, and I think it could be a meaningful. It could be useful, right? For people who just like don't know what to do and they want someone to tell them what to do, I could see a setup that could work really well where you go into an office, they put you on some type of plan for your skin, and they alter that plan based on your results from month to month or quarter to quarter, right? So it's like, okay, my goal is to improve fine lines and wrinkles. I'm going to go and I'm going to do these procedures. I'm going to do this skincare. And then in three months, I'm going to see you back and I'm going to alter it so that you can move towards your goal. So I think wellness plans for the skin will become popular because I think that's where the industry is going towards. And I think some people will really benefit from it where I think a lot of other people who are very knowledgeable about skincare and do their own research can come up with their own plans. Uh, but I think there's going to be a subsect of people who just want someone to tell them what to do. And they want to be on one of these plans, just like somebody who likes a personal trainer. Somebody's going to like a personal trainer for the skin. Yeah, that's good. Makes sense. Uh, interestingly, you don't really get that super well at a professional office, dermatology office, because the medical system is not built out to build you a skincare routine 
for a lot of those changes and the, it's this hyper efficient model. So I, I can definitely see an unmet need there. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to this next article. This is business of fashion. I'm just going to talk about the headline because I think this is a discussion I want to have with the audience. And I'm just curious from my own point of view, because this is an internal struggle on our end. So business of fashion, the name of the article is why beauty can't break up with anti-aging. And kind of the sub headline here is despite brands public promises to ditch the term and switch to more inclusive language, many shoppers still secretly or publicly want products with anti-aging qualities. So, you know, this is something that we just struggled with internally. Um, we're working with on a product that is targeted towards aging skin um, transparently. And in that process, we had a lot of discussions about what to name the product. And anti-aging has become like a very sort of dirty term uh, because people are like, well, you know, this concept of anti-aging, it's unhealthy. Skin is meant to age. And we have, if you've watched Dr. Maxfield and I over the past, you know, four years, we've consistently said this, right? Like that aging is beautiful. Aging is a process that you should embrace and enjoy. And that like trying to fight off every wrinkle, every smile line is not practical, nor is it healthy for you. Um, but now like the question is like people want products that have quote unquote anti-aging qualities or qualities that sustain skin health or can improve fine lines and wrinkles. And the question is, how do you message around these when the consumer is looking for these things, but now it's kind of taboo to even use that terminology. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't see a solution. I haven't really adjusted my language as much as probably most, but it's because I think, yeah, I, I kind of feel like that if it was me, that's what I'm looking for. Like we, again, we've very consistently, like I'm not going for perfect skin myself. I'm going to have wrinkles. I'm going to have dark spots because of my lifestyle and I'm okay with that. And I purely, truly embrace aging for myself and like want everyone to feel comfortable in their skin. But the other side of it is like, I, what am I looking for this wrinkle? If the wrinkle bothers me, I want something to get rid of the wrinkle. H how can you pair in terminology? Just logically, how can you pair in terminology something that will erase a wrinkle, get rid of a wrinkle, but you're going to say like the pro aging thing, like it, it's kind of a paradox that you're promoting aging. Is that what this product does? Oh, I don't want that. That's going to make me older. Like you, you just from like a language standpoint, it seems like you have to have like it undoes this, it prevents this, it stops this. And I, again, I think anti-aging does have staying power and perhaps it's just a global conversation needs to shift. Like can you talk about anti-aging in like a healthy way that promotes an overall healthy lifestyle? Like, can you get older and say you were doing things to like slow that down and be okay with that? And I think that for me personally, I'm fine with it. Like I am going to use this product because it has anti-aging properties. It's like anti-inflammatory. Am I going to go use this pro-inflammatory antioxidant? Pro-inflammatory, pro-oxidant antioxidant. Like, no, <laughs> like, yeah, I think the messaging can be simple. I think the global conversation probably just has to shift to really encourage people to feel comfortable in their skin and comfortable with the changes that occur over time, but just know that there are things that can help with that. Yeah, I, I think the, the thing is that people are looking for, for products with these properties, but they don't want this term like aging or anti-aging associated with it. And I don't know if this is something that's truly coming from the public or it's something that's just like one of those like beauty insider, you know, cause there's a lot of like, there's a beauty community and the beauty community gets hyper focused on terminologies and phrases and, um, you know, different things like clean beauty, like was big. And then it was like the anti clean beauty movement. And then, so the, the, the skincare community and the people who are really skincare enthusiasts, they really like really kind of like hone in on certain things. And one of the terms they don't like is anti-aging. And so is that truly reflective of the public, like the average person, or is it only reflective of like the beauty enthusiasts who kind of hyper focus on this being like a negative term? Um, and then to your point, like people want products with these ingredients that can combat the signs of aging, which are fine lines and wrinkles and texture and dark spots and larger pores and even dry skin. And so how do you message to the consumer who wants these products, but you can't even use the terminology that they would recognize in your marketing because it's considered taboo. So I, I do think it's challenging because me personally, I want, again, anti-aging products or products that can target 
the signs of aging. And so how do I message that? Um, and how do I find the products if I, if anti-aging is a word that you're not allowed to use? Right. So I know I tear to your thing. It's all about like semantics at this point. Um, I think that people kind of know what they want. They want retinol to help with their fine lines and wrinkles. They want peptides, they want exfoliants. Right. So, um, the question is like, how do you message it in a way that's inclusive and feels like you're not making aging a negative thing, but it's about taking your skin, care of your skin in a healthy way. And so you'll hear about how we decided to message it um, with a particular phrase, but I'll be curious once you guys see the product launch, what you think about what we called the product and whether or not it resonates with what your needs are. You know what I think it might be? I think it's like this uh, extreme youth movement where like, so let's say you have an anti-aging product and there's a picture of like a 17 year old individual on there, right? Like a 17 year old girl, like skin is flawless. She's beautiful. Everything's perfect. And the, the product is, you know, really geared towards a 40 or 50 year old person. And I think one of the positive things has been more of the mature skincare, like the more of the, the people who are going to be using the products, the 40 year olds, 50 year olds, 60 year olds, et cetera, like in the actual commercials in that. And I think that's a good way to promote aging gracefully and healthily and realistically where you can use the product and you can get like clinical statistical results, but having like a realistic expectation, like this is what beauty is. Like, this is what we look like. This is what I'm going to look like. It's 60 and it's beautiful. Right. Um, as opposed to having and selling like a transformative idea that, uh, if you don't look 20, if you don't look like the person on the cover here, like you're, you're, you're falling short. So I, I think that is maybe a, a good step in the right direction that I have seen change over the last mm, few years, five years. A hundred percent. I mean, people want products that are targeted towards them that look like they're meant for them. And that means that they want to see, they want to see models and they want to see influencers and they want to see people and celebrities that are their age that are talking about these products. And yeah, like if you have, if you do an anti-aging commercial uh, or a product that's targeted towards aging skin and you're using somebody who's like 18 in the commercial like you know it's it, it's not going to resonate with people and it's going to feel like you're trying to achieve some goal that's both unrealistic um and putting a negative light on the the real realities of aging skin right so um to kind of sum this up here um they mentioned that search data and product launches prove the term is still popular and they and it resonates with consumers the term anti-aging but brands are keenly aware of committing a faux pas. So I'm just curious in the comments um, on, on YouTube here, uh, let me know if the word anti-aging bothers you. And if so, what term would you prefer? That's the million dollar question. Um, so the next, the next co conversation I just want to talk into is a, a something coming out of McKinsey. McKinsey is the largest consulting firm. My sister used to work for McKinsey. It's uh, the most prominent consulting firm in the world. And they they consult on everything from skincare all the way to like they consult on governments and things like that. They are very, very well known in the industry. Um, never clear to me what consultants do. <laughs> That's coming from <laughs> with my my sister and my brother-in-law, both in consulting, uh, never quite clear to me what the job was, but um, they definitely did things. So uh, I want to, I want to talk about what they mentioned here um, as far as like growth of skincare and what they're seeing for, for towards the future, which I think was interesting. So I'm going to kind of like highlight a few things here. So they said skincare, the sec, the sector's largest category, which is like within beauty, um, accounts for 44% of the market. It grew 6% in 2023, uh, continues to grow in countries outside of the U S even faster. So Middle East, Africa, and Latin America, um, you know, growing in, in those markets as well, where China has been relatively flat. Uh, they expect it to grow at the same rate over the next four years. And they are targeting, they, they think that, you know, men's skincare will drive a lot of this. Gen Z and Gen Alpha will also drive a lot of this. But they also mentioned the skinification of hair and that hair category is expected to grow even faster over the next few years, which I actually see happening and I think will happen. Um, and then they also mentioned that the fragrance market is outpacing the skincare market in terms of growth and that this year, um, the makeup market has finally outgrown the 2019 makeup market, meaning that 
makeup took a huge dive in 2019 COVID, um, and then and then kind of reached its nadir probably in 2022, and then now has finally surpassed the 2019. So basically, uh, so basically, makeup back on the rise, uh, fragrance on the rise, um, and that skincare is growing, but not as fast as it was once growing and hair care, they expect to continue to grow. So what are your thoughts on that? Is that something that you see happening? Is that, is that your general feeling uh, of what you see in content and with your patients? I think it definitely is. I mean, we called this out. It wasn't even last year's trend. It was the year before. So that'd be what the end of 2022, we said hair care next year is the year of hair care. And uh, we were proven correct and that that has grown and it continues to grow. But interestingly, I think with hair care, it hasn't been this like, um, just like stratospheric peak. I actually think it's sustainable. So I, I think hair care has staying power. And, um, it, I mean, if you just watch people with hair, if I had long hair, boy, if I had long hair and a hairline down to my eyebrows, I would be making hair content all day, but I just don't have the hairline for it, you know, but, uh, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> It's sustainable. I think it's going to continue to grow. And I think the market breakdown is interesting. I think that the China market being kind of static is a very, I, I would love to like dive into more as to why that is. The interesting thing on this paper too, is that they said the luxury growth, which is kind of counter to. Oh yeah. I saw this. Brands. This is yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. They, say it. Yeah. But they expect the luxury brands to outpace the um, affordable skincare brands, basically over the next few years. And um, it's interesting. I wonder if it's, it, this doesn't take into account, because the other study we talked about looked at like basically derm-backed brands, like the derm skincare brands were out, significantly outpacing luxury brands. And then this one is kind of more like just luxury versus mass skincare. So I, I would, I actually would be shocked if the luxury brands had, uh, had, a, had a big increase over the next four years. I, th I still think those are on the way out. No, I agree with you. I think that this is a miss here on their prediction. So this is, so they have, this report covers both historic data. So basically what's happened over the past four years, and then they start to make predictions about what happens in the next four years. And part of their next four year predictions is that prestige will grow faster. I don't know that it will become a bigger market share uh, than mass and mastige, but they expect it to grow faster in terms of just like growth. Um, and I just don't see prestige growing faster than mass and mastige. I think, I think mastige will grow faster than mass. And I think mastige will grow faster than prestige. Um, am I biased because remedy falls into the mastige category as far as pricing goes? <laughs> uh, yes, slightly. But I think the reason why is because you can get prestige products at the mastige point, but you can't get prestige products at the mass price point. So what I think. I expect to happen is that consumers become very aware of ingredients and what is actually working for their skin. They're looking for value when they're shopping for those. They're not willing to pay the $180. They find something in that like $30 to $40 range that would be in the mastige price point, but can deliver that level of quality. Whereas if you get into that like $8, $10 products, you're really just not going to get the number of ingredients at the concentrations um, that you would. So like, I think that mastige will grow because it will take from both prestige um, in the sense of people saying, I want to get something that's more affordable, but equally as effective. And I think it will take from mass because it will say, okay, people in mass will say, I want something that's going to deliver a little bit more and I'm willing to pay a little bit more to achieve that. That's my thesis. Um, but, you know, I'm not McKinsey and I don't have, you know, billions of dollars to do the research on this. So they could be right in the end. But I'm also curious. I mean, I'm asking the audience a lot today, but I'm curious to what, like what you all think about shopping, you know, a hundred dollar moisturizer and whether or not in the past, like, let's say five years, you've went towards more affordable brands or, you know, are you looking to spend a little bit more on beauty? This would be interesting. I think we should pull this on the larger channels and uh, because, yeah, I, I do want to know what the sentiment is, where all of you are headed. Like, does the $100 moisturizer move you these days? Um, is that where you're wanting to go? Or are you looking to save a little more? Or is like that $40 price point perfect for most people? So, yeah, I would love to see what everyone's sentiment is um, and where life is leading you in the future. Yeah. Um, we covered a ton on this podcast today. <laughs> so thank you all so much for tuning in. Uh, we will see you next week. 
we're getting back to our regular programming and we're also thinking about maybe adding some guests to the podcast, um, maybe some people who could talk about things a little bit outside of our scope, uh, but still relevant to skincare and beauty in general. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, let us know if there's anybody you want to see on the podcast with us. Uh, that would be interesting. And we're thinking about maybe even doing some of these in person at some point. So we've been getting some comments on the main channel about the podcast. We're missing a few weeks. So we apologize for those of you who um, who look forward to these. We look forward to them as well. And we always appreciate all of your support. Yeah, we definitely do. So thanks for the comments. Can't wait for the feedback on these topics. And we will see you next week. All right. Thank you, everyone. See you next time.